afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be back here in Trondheim. Now, what I will do today, it's, uh, it's only 15 minutes, but I, I will share with you some of the work we're doing at uh, MIT, at the Sensible City Lab. You know, we don't like the word smart city. Smart, we think, you know, sensible city gives a bit more the idea that people should be at the center of the city. There should be a city that senses, that responds to us. And we focus on cities because, you know, just four numbers about cities. <clears throat> Cities are 2% of the Earth's crust, they're 50% of the population, 75% of energy consumption, and 80% of CO2 emissions. So if we can do something for making our cities better, then that can be a big deal. And so let me tell you a bit about our philosophy. Now, I'm not sharing this because this is making our cities better, but because something interesting happened in, our city, in, in, in Formula One over the past 15, 20 years. Now, 15, 20 years ago, if you wanted to win a Formula One race, you needed a good car and a good driver, like in this case. Now, today, if you want to win a race, you also need a system like this. It's a system made of thousands and thousands of sensors onto the car, collecting information in real time, sending it to those computers where it's analyzed, it's processed, and decisions are made in real time. In other terms, if you're an engineer, you might call that a real-time control system, which is a system made of two components, basically, a sensing component, collecting information, and an actuating component, responding to the information. The sensing and actuating is really what every dynamic system does. It's really what every living system does. You know, we just met now, so we shake hands, we sense each other, we collect the information from each other, and then we respond to that, to that information we collect. Now, the amazing thing we believe today is that our cities are becoming a little bit like real-time control systems, a little bit, little bit like that Formula One racing car. They've been covered with many different types of digital information, and digital and physical are kind of coming together, almost as if every atom out there were becoming both a sensor and an actuator. Now, you might ask, uh, all of this is fine, but you know, how is this changing, really, our interaction with cities? And um, there was an exhibition at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, a few months ago. We were part of that exhibition. The, ti the, ti the title of the exhibition was Talk to Me. And they use it quite a bit because the, the point they made is that because of this, because of technology, <clears throat> it is as if our cities, our buildings, our objects were starting to talk back to us, to engage with us in a different way. It's almost like the old dream of Michelangelo. You know, when Michelangelo sculpted the Mose, so the story goes. He took a hammer, he threw it at the mouse, there's still a little chip on the knee, and he shouted, perché non parli? Why don't you speak? And today, our things, our cities are starting to speak back to us. Now, in the, ne in the, in the next uh, 12 minutes, what I will do is show you some examples of what we are doing at this pace of talking cities in between sensing and actuating. First, I want to share with you some projects about sensing, how we can collect information from our cities in a way we couldn't before. Now, in this project, we looked at a computer, like this computer, it's down there. You know everything about it today. Every chip, you know where it was produced, how it moved on the planet, how it became that machine. You see it here. However, a few years from now, when you throw away that machine, sometimes this is what happens. Sometimes all the electronics go to Africa, to Asia, they go where they shouldn't go. Uh, you know, basically today, we know where our objects come from. We don't know where they go. So our idea was, what if we designed a little chip, we did it, a little chip, we did it with uh, Qualcomm, a um, chip producer in the United States, and then put a chip on trash and follow trash to see what happened to the garbage we throw away. So here you see the first deployment we did in Seattle. The project is continuing still now. We had, uh, maybe if you can lower the volume a little bit. We had uh, um, 500 volunteers and 3,000 pieces of trash. Every possible thing, as you see here, And after tagging all of that, we started following it. You see 3,000 objects from the city of Seattle, the day of deployment. Then you see them going to some of the main landfills next to Seattle. But then a big surprise, how far things started traveling. Actually, look at this after two weeks, and sometimes in a crazy way. Look at the trace that went all the way here for thousands of kilometers, and then went down to Baja, California. <laughs> and they're still moving. Think how much, how much energy is wasted in that. And still moving after one month or two months all across the United States.
we thought that's the music we needed. The fire was in it. <laughs> so, now what you can do with this, what you can do, you can actually get all this information and design a better system. So if you are an engineer, you can use it to actually optimize the system. Actually, the other important thing is that you can share this information with people. And then all of us, then people, all of us, we can change our behavior based on more information we have today. One of the interesting things was at the end of the project, somebody came to us and said, you know, I used to drink water in plastic bottles every day, but now I know that those bottles actually go a few miles from home to a dump and, st and stay there forever, so I stopped drinking water in plastic bottles. Now, I'll share with you another thing that we discovered. Actually, that was more recent, just a few months ago. It happened that a burglar came to our lab at MIT, installed a lot of stuff, including some of the tags that tell you where they go. <laughs> and here, here is what happened. a t-shirt with a business address. <laughs> All right, so I mean, this was an example of how what we can tag today and, and information we can get today. You know, there's plenty of other information we can get. Uh, we have actually a research lab in Singapore as well, and actually in Singapore we're really looking at all these dimensions of data we can collect from cities. Imagine a living city where you know in real time all what's happening around yourself. So that's information from the cell phone network in real time, telling you where activity happens in Singapore on the island. Energy consumption and temperature, you know, Singapore is very hot, so when it gets too hot you turn on the air conditioning, you see it here in this graph, where the energy is consumed, how the city changes when you got a special event, like in this case, um, it's about the Formula One racing. So everybody going down there to Marina to look at it. Even simple things like, you know, here you got taxis and rain. It usually rains in Singapore in patches, not across the whole island. So how can you actually combine this information in order to, to give a better service to citizens and taxi drivers? Or, oh, you know, almost this island expands and shrinks because of travel time. We were talking before uh, in the previous presentations about traffic and how you can make it more efficient. Here is actually how during the day, because of congestion, the city expands and shrinks. And then all the global flows, how they intersect with the local flows. So the connection between the two, the airport and the port, all the containers coming in, the flights coming in and, uh, and going out. So the idea is almost, can you almost try to develop a tweeting web? <clears throat> like a web that has all this real-time information and use it to develop new type of apps uh, in Singapore. So that was really just a very quick overview about this idea of sensing. How today we can actually sense and collect information from our cities, our buildings, in a, in a way we couldn't just a few years ago. <clears throat> so now, in the last remaining minutes, what I, in the second part of the presentation, what I wanted to share with you is uh, actually the other component, the actuating component. How can we use this then to design new objects or buildings or things that actually respond to that information? Systems that, you know, become more interactive with us. And the first project I want to share with you is actually a project in Copenhagen. The mayor came to us uh, a few years ago and, you know, with a very precise question. It was about all of these ubiquitous computing technologies, and how actually they can help us to change, uh, uh, could, could help us in, with traffic and movement in the city. Now, the amazing thing about Copenhagen, as you all know, is that uh, if you think about traffic in Copenhagen, that's what it looks like. You know, it's a lot of bicycles, 30 to 50 percent of all trips every day done by bicycle. So we started working with bicycles and came up with the following idea. Welcome to the Copenhagen Wheel. The wheel that turns your ordinary bike into a smart electric hybrid. 
quickly and easily with no additional batteries or wires. The Copenhagen wheel allows you to capture the energy dissipated while braking and cycling, and save it for when you need a bit of a boost. Controlled through your smartphone, the Copenhagen wheel becomes a natural extension of your everyday life. The Copenhagen wheel is your personal trainer, sensing your effort level and providing you with real-time feedback about your fitness and exercise goals. The Copenhagen wheel also enhances your experience of the city. It connects you with things a cyclist wants to know. Upcoming traffic congestion, road conditions and pollution levels. Choose to keep your data or share it with your friends and other cyclists through social networks like Facebook. As you ride, you also collect green miles. It's similar to a frequent flyer program, but good for the environment. Elegant, responsive, smart. A new mode of transport for a rapidly changing world. So turn on your life and turn on the city. The Copenhagen Wheel. So actually this was the wheel, the first prototype. Um, it took us then a couple of years. Now we've done two years of iterations and uh, refining the prototype. There is a startup that got uh, just a few weeks ago um, venture capital funds to actually manufacture and start, start producing it. But here you can see actually the mayor of Copenhagen, the former mayor of Copenhagen, trying the wheel for the first time, um, also with the mayor of Toronto. It was still the first, the first prototype. It's much lighter and a bit thinner now. I will follow. I said, run away, run away, run away. Oh, I felt it. This is a felt that he felt actually the motor kick in. is fantastic. It's incredible. It takes no effort. You see my bike? You start pedaling and the motor takes over. And then it, it will tell you the air quality, te temperature. <laughs> And um, as a last project I want to share with you um, is actually, you know, we've been discussing quite a lot today smart cities, but, you know, cities are made of buildings. The physical form of the city or spaces or the beauty of architecture we're doing is very, very important. So it's about technology, yes, we can talk about smart cities from the point of view of computer science or optimization as engineers, but in the end, you know, really is about creating beautiful spaces and urban spaces for all of us. In this case, I want to share with you a project we did with the mayor of Saragossa. Saragossa won the World Expo uh, just before Shanghai. <coughs> 2008, and the mayor came to us just before the expo with a precise question. The theme of the expo was water, and you know, water has been a beautiful ingredient of urban planning. Just look around here, around ourselves, look at you know, all of southern Europe, how people have been using water in planning the city. And his point was, you know, how can we use water today in a different way? Now, one idea that came up uh, at a workshop at MIT was, imagine you have a pipe, and on this pipe, you have many uh, tabs, opening and closing, controlled by a computer. Then what you can do, you can create a water wall that's actually digitally controlled. So you can use it to write, to show images, text, patterns. You see here the guy is uh, jumping, and you know, the water wall opens up to, to let him jump through. So we got a commission to design the building at the entrance of the expo called uh, Digital Water Pavilion. The whole building is made of water. No doors or windows, but actually, when you, open, when you approach the building, it opens up to let you in. And then all this water you can write on and show images, text, or patterns. When you're inside, also, the walls expand and shrink based on how many people you have. So it be, the space becomes fluid and responsive. The roof is also covered with a thin layer of water. So on the top, uh, it's also like this full box made of water. And then, you know, if you've got too much wind, you can actually lower the roof to minimize splashing. Uh, or at the end of the day, you can actually close the building and the architecture disappears. <laughs> Hopefully without anybody underneath. <laughs>
<laughs> we, have, we have sensors for that as well. And then here you can see actually then, well, you know, then we did the video, we were not sure if they would actually build it. Um, then actually that year, um, 2008 Time Magazine named it uh, best project of the year. Then in the, at the end, you know, we were very excited, they gave us the commission to, to actually build it. Here it was before the opening, this guy um, actually was stopping by with a trolley, you see, you know, he stayed late for like 15 minutes trying to say, what the hell is going on in, in the building? Trying to figure out what was happening inside the building. Here it was myself trying not to get wet, you know, entering and testing the sensors. Here it was actually at the opening also adding visual information on the top of the water, so the kind of uh, pixels, light pixels together with pixels made of water. You know, I should tell you now what happened one night when all of the sensors that actually detect people when they approach stop working. You know, all the sensors, you know, the, the building is like a big computer, you know, and like the computer crashed, so the building would keep on doing its own crazy things and cuts and holes and text and the images and patterns, but then wouldn't respond to people anymore. And actually, that night, we were terrified because, you know, we say, what will happen? Um, but actually, that night was one of the most fun nights ever. That night, thousands of kids from all of the city came to the building to actually play a new game. Not anymore the game of a building that, you know, you approach it and it opens up to let you in, but a building that does like this. <laughs> and I wanted to finish with this image because, you know, as architects, engineers, we always think that we know how people will use the things we design. And as things become much more smart, if you want, much more interactive, full of technologies, then, you know, things become much, also much more dynamic. But then, you know, the important thing is that uh, reality, and especially human reality, is always a surprise. In this case, it was a good surprise. Thank you. <laughs>